So we're about to start with uh, the next panel in this relentless schedule. Um, so um, instability in financial markets will be our topic. And um, I think uh, the instability in financial markets is one of the, the, the areas or is a perfect example why uh, new economic thinking is needed. Um, mainstream economics, mainstream macroeconomists tended to uh, well ignore um, the, the possibility of instability, at least when it came to developed countries and developed financial markets. Instability was thought uh, until 2007 to happen in um, developing countries, emerging markets, but not in the allegedly sophisticated and well-developed financial markets um, of the Western world. Um, it was just taken for granted. Raghu Rajan once made the nice comparison that it was uh, something like the plumbing of, of the financial system, which was, yeah, nothing we, we had to, to worry about. And I think the last four years really proved us, uh, proved otherwise, and um, showed that it's really necessary to, to take a deep look at the plumbing of the financial system. And this is what we are going to do with a very sophisticated and, and uh, interesting panel, which I will briefly introduce. So we have Domenico Deligatti from the Catholic University of Milan, who had the privilege to work personally with Hyman Minsky, one of the big thinkers of financial instability. Um, he told me that he visited him for his PhD thesis in 1986. And um, currently, uh, Domenico is um, well dealing, looking at the, at, at the role financial factors in business um, uh, fluctuations play, and he has developed one of the few models um, with where, where, where agent-based modeling is used in the for, for a macroeconomic environment. Um, the second speaker will be Michael Goldberg uh, from the University of New Hampshire the co-author of um, two very interesting and very important books, Imperfect Knowledge Economics and Beyond Mecha Mechanical Markets, which try to yeah, make the next step and try to develop a theory what you do when you leave rational expectations um, behind. Then we have Steve Keen from uh, the University of Western uh, um, Sydney. Um, who's running uh, a very well-known blog, Debt Deflation, and is in a, was in a very lively discussion with Paul Krugman recently. And I think you, you're going to dwell uh, into this di discussion as well. I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, last but not least, we have Moritz Schullerich from the Free University of Berlin, who's doing uh, very interesting research. I've personally uh, written about uh, several of your papers. Um, in Handelsblatt about well how debt and debt cycles destabilize um, yeah Western economies and you collected uh, very convincing historical evidence for this so I'm really looking forward to this conversation and Domenico please the floor is yours uh, it's a privilege to be here and uh, in this session on financial instability, and I think that uh, uh, when uh, can upload the presentation, please. Uh, one uh, in good way of st uh, starting the discussion is from Hyman Minsky, uh, since this is a financial instability uh, session. Uh, um, Minsky's ideas can be cast in purely aggregative terms, this is a quote from Kenny Tappen again, 1982, and uh, is uh, actually uh, telling the usual story on financial instability. Uh, at the end of this uh, um, increase of financial fragility during a boom, you may have a financial crisis, properly speaking, a Minsky moment in the jargon of the media these days, or a large fluctuations in the business cycle. What I want to uh, actually stress that uh, uh, from the mid late 80s, there's been a, a relatively large literature uh, that has somehow uh, taken up uh, one insight at least of Minsky's idea, which is the uh, financial accelerator literature. 
And there are three frameworks in this uh, type of literature, one by Bernanke, Gertler, and lately uh, Bernanke, Gertler, and Gilchrist. Uh, the the uh, framework by Kiyotaki and Moore on credit cycles, and the framework by Greenwald and Stiglitz uh, on uh, uh, financial market imperfection and business cycles. And in the wake of the global financial crisis, there has been a uh, large and I think growing literature in which basically uh, the new Keynesian dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model has been augmented by financial frictions. And there is a non exhaustive list of authors here in this literature, which is still booming. Uh, so starting from different premises and different methodological uh, uh, points of view, uh, this literature yields uh, some uh, uh, predictions that are at least in line with some of Minsky's insights. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this uh, in detail, it's a long story, but to make a st long story short, I think that Minsky got a point here, and uh, uh, this point is actually nowadays at the center of the macroeconomic debate. Uh, um, should, we, uh, should we be satisfied with this? My answer is no. Why? Because Minsky's legacy goes, uh, matter-of-factly, much beyond the emphasis on financial factors in business fluctuations and provide important direction for current economic research. Uh, in my view, and the view of uh, my friends and co-authors, uh, the role of heterogeneous financial condition is the element of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis that was there and has not been incorporated in the financial accelerator literature, at least so far, uh, that has been under-researched and has uh, to be actually pursued and be a, can be a cornerstone of a new research agenda. Uh, and in fact, Minsky's ideas can be cast in an heterogeneous agent setting because he was actually pioneering this idea of the taxonomy of agents or units, as he said, uh, in terms of uh, edge, it is safe, speculative, and Ponzi units. Uh, the Financial instability story can be cast in this uh, type of framework because essentially what happens during a boom is that uh, financial fragility economy-wide is going up because the structure of the population of firms, for instance, is changing over time uh, and the uh, fraction of speculative Ponzi unit in the population is going up. Uh, this kind of idea has not been actually pushed much further after uh, Minsky, but I think that uh, uh, this is exactly where we can start for a new research agenda. The financial instability, financial accelerator type of story can be cast in, uh, uh, in a context of heterogeneous agents may be by means of multi-agent or it is uh, agent-based models. I've been working uh, in this area for some years now uh, together with Mauro Gallegati who is here. Uh, we are being called by Minsky the cats. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's uh, the story. And that this can be also an acronym for complex adaptive trivial systems, which is exactly the type of framework that we like uh, for these kind of models. And a number of junior uh, co-authors. We have adopted in this kind of framework the greenwald stiglitz variant of the financial accelerator story. So at the end of the day, uh, to model individual behavior, we start from the idea that the scale of activity of an agent, whatever its field, uh, uh, is uh, a function of its financial robustness, which is captured by, for instance, the ratio of net worth to uh, total assets, the inverse of uh, leverage, which we call the equity ratio. Uh, in a multi-agent setting of this type, the dynamics of the model are described by a myriad of uh, laws of motion of the individual equity ratios, each one for one agent. Uh, which turns out to be a multidimensional system of nonlinear difference equations subject to stochastic shocks, a very complicated animal. It is impossible to compute closed form solutions for such a system, even if there are some new techniques that are brewing in the pipeline, and you will see maybe in the future some interesting developments from this point of view. And so for now, we have to resort to computer simulations. Well, these models, I don't go into details, can reproduce the empirical evidence both at the aggregate 
and at the cross-sectional level, something that uh, the usual representative agent macro model cannot do. So we have irregular fluctuations punctuated by great contractions. We can reproduce labor market stylized facts such as the Phillips curve, Occam's law, the beverage curve, the skew distribution of firm size, so, and so on and so forth, you name it. Uh, you can have more of this in the paper that sooner or later will be uploaded on the website. Uh, one thing that I want to stress, which is somehow nice, uh, is the idea of a macroeconomic externality. In one of the models that we have been de uh, developing, uh, the low motion of the individual equity ratio is simply a nonlinear function, uh, difference equation uh, of this uh, form here. And uh, uh, AT is the equity ratio time T, AI T minus one equity ratio team time T minus one, and RT is the interest rate. From the output of this simulation, it is immediate to compute the moments of the distributions of the equity ratio, uh, meaning the cross-sectional mean and variance for each time period. Now, in the paper that I'm quoting, in the, uh, in, uh, in, in, that, that I'm quoting, what happens is that you need a bit of equilibrium thinking. I'm sorry for this, for those in the audience that you really hate equilibrium, equilibrium thinking. This is not my case. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, Mauro has something more to do, uh, uh, more to blame on this. But however, with a bit of equilibrium thinking, what you end up with is a function of the interest rate, which is, looks like this one. So the interest rate, economy-wide, uniform across agents, depends on the moments of the distribution of the equity uh, ratio. So if you substitute equation two into equation one, you end up with this stuff here. And the interesting point here is the emergence of a macroeconomic externality, because as you see, the uh, dynamics of the individual equity ratio depends on the uh, average uh, equity ratio and variance. So the economy-wide financial conditions captured by this cross-sectional mean and variance do impact upon the individual financial conditions. And uh, this macroeconomic externality in this kind of models is actually the source of the amplification mechanism that you usually label the financial accelerator. And therefore, the financial sector is actually deeply affected by heterogeneity. Uh, let me make some advertisement here. Uh, there are other agent-based models that uh, are characterized by the important role for uh, financial factors. Uh, there is a a uh, group in uh, the US, OWIT and co-authors are working on this type of models. Uh, Giovanni Dosi, who is, is around here, uh, and the Santana School have developed a model of this type, and then there is a model by uh, the so-called Urace group, Cincotti and David. A complementary line of research is the research on uh, financial agent-based models, in which heterogeneous expectations play a very important role. Uh, Carl Soms and the Centev group have been pioneering this type of work. And we, uh, at present, are trying to make an encompassing effort. There is a European project which is called CRISIS, which is an acronym for Complexity-Based Research Initiative on Systemic Instabilities. Even the acronym are quite complex uh, here. Uh, in which uh, I and Maura are playing a role, uh, there is a bunch of first-rate uh, econophysicist, Don Farmer, Jean-Philippe Bouchot is here, uh, Rosario Mantegna, Carl Soms, and there is a sprinkle of INET because Bain Ocker also is a major figure in crisis. Uh, sooner or later, that's at least is the challenge that we are facing. We want to put together the financial and macro agent-based model into a large agent-based model for the European economy. Um, but let me make a step farther uh, in describing this research agenda. What we are doing now is to think the, uh, of the economy as a credit network. So essentially what we do is to think of uh, the economy as a set of nodes that are linked together by financial or borrowing lending relationship, what we call credit interlinkages. Uh, in this case, you have externalities that are obviously pervasive due to the network structure of the economy. Uh, and that's uh, a stylized representation of what, uh, what's going on. You have nodes here, and you have links, of course. 
Each node can be hit by idiosyncratic shock. Uh, and due to the borrowing lending relationship, some nodes at a certain point, for some reason, can go bankrupt. That's the case on node F here. So you have distress propagation through the network structure. And you can also have uh, the, fail, the default of one agent. In this network structure, it's quite easily and straightforward to have bankruptcy avalanches due to the fact that one agent is going out of the network and is actually spreading the bankruptcy uh, uh, through the economy. Uh, once again, there is a large group of people working on this issue. Uh, Mauro, of course, Greenwald Distributors have been instrumental in uh, developing this kind of framework. Stefano Battiston, who is here, and Alberto Russo. Uh, once again, there is a similarity between the credit network type of ideas and the agent-based model because once we start from the idea that individual behavior can be described by the Greenwald Stiglitz type of agent. Uh, but of course, in a credit network, the scale of activity does depend, depends not only on the financial robustness of the agent himself or herself, but also on the financial robustness of the agents that are connected to this agent. So this is the important part of the story that you can capture only by the network structure of the economy. One thing that I want to stress here is the role of connectivity. So we start with the simple measure of connectivity, which is the degree. K is a number of links related to a, net, to a node in a network. If n is the size of the population, you have a complete network when each agent is connected to the, each other agent, so n, man, n minus 1. K is equal to n minus 1. Uh, it is well known that higher de degree, higher density of the network is actually conducive to better diversification of idiosyncratic risk. Uh, this is uh, well known. Uh, but uh, because of the uh, pioneering work of Allen and Gale, but there's also the possibility, which is the novel feature of this kind of network, of a positive feedback that uh, in a paper that uh, we have labeled the liaison dangereuse uh, is called the trend reinforcement. Incidentally, the title is the only contribution that I made to the, to the paper, but I'm very proud of it. Uh, so what is the rationale for trend reinforcement, which is this novel feature? Well, uh, let me attach a couple of stories. I think I will uh, actually emphasize only one. The first uh, type of story is adapted from uh, Bernanke, Gertler, and Gilchrist, in a sense. And so we call this the network-based financial accelerator. So suppose that there, there is an agent, agent I, who is a borrower, and is experiencing a period of increasing financial fragility for any reasons. Uh, the partner, so the lenders in the, in, the, in the network, react by this increase in financial fragility by making co credit conditions harder, so increasing the interest rate. Uh, and uh, um, uh, why this is so? Well, if you believe in the Bernanke get a this type of story, the interest rate is actually equal to a benchmark interest rate augmented by a so-called external finance premium, which depends positively on financial fragility of the borrower. So this is exactly what happens here. If the financial fragility of the borrower goes up, the lender reacts by increasing the interest rate. As a consequence, financial fragility increases even farther for the agent. So this is the source of the trend reinforcement. And in terms of financial fragility, when things go bad, they can go worse. I have another story that I will skip, by the way, but this is actually adapted from Adrian and Sheen. You can have more on the, the paper. Uh, now, what is the relationship between trend reinforcement and connectivity? If the environment, quotation mark, is relatively noisy, it's turbulent somehow, a given decrease of robustness per interval of time is somehow tolerated by the partners and is considered normal and is not punished. So trend reinforcement is not activated. On the other hand, if environment is relatively stable, a given the same kind of decrease of robustness or increase in fragility is considered abnormal by the partners and activates the uh, um, punishment. So trend reinforcement is activated. The important point, uh, be, the, the important link between uh, uh, trend reinforcement and connectivity is that we show in the paper that uh, an increase in degree, in the density, makes the environment more stable. 
Why is this so? Well, because it allows for a better diversification of risk. So we take seriously this idea. So an in increase in density is actually increasing the uh, capability of agents to diversify risk, makes the environment more stable. But at that point, when the, 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 the environment becomes more stable, uh, trend reinforcement can be activated more frequently. And uh, that's the reason why you can have uh, a trend reinforcement. And uh, what's uh, the uh, punchline here? Well, uh, in the absence of trend reinforcement, without this kind of positive effect, what happens? Well, the probability of failure or bankruptcy economy-wide, which is the PF, uh, is going down monotonically with density, which is exactly what you would uh, expect if you were in the Allen and Gale's shoes. On the other hand, and of course, if K goes to N minus one, if you go towards completeness, and N is very large, what happens is that the probability of failure goes asymptotically to zero. So in this case, an increasing in density, an in a boost towards financial integration is always a good thing. If, on the other hand, you have trend reinforcement, which we call the Stiglitz view, PF, the probability of failure, is not decreasing monotonically with K. And uh, in fact, we have two forces uh, actually at uh, uh, work in the economy they are going in opposite directions. So what happens? Uh, if K increases, the, K, uh, the, the environment becomes more stable and makes the punishment of increasing financial fragility more likely. At a certain point, stability, stability can be destabilizing, which is a quite Minskian uh, remark. So this is the end uh, of the story. With no uh, trend reinforcement, the green line is actually showing you that the probability of failure is going down monotonically and tends to zero with the diversification degree K. Which you have, if you have financial accelerator, this is the situation. So you go down and then up. You have a non-monotonicity here. Well, so what? The policy implication is very important. So let me provide a very simple, at least tentative suggestion for Dodd-Frank II whenever it will come up. Uh, if you are a policymaker and you care for minimizing the probability of bankruptcy, probably you should uh, somehow uh, try to control connectivity. So the problem is not only the too big to fail problem, uh, which is uh, on the table, uh, has been on the table for a long time during the crisis, but uh, the problem of too interconnected to fail. So in a sense, uh, if we were actually able to produce something like that with data, we should have an idea of where to cut uh, the uh, type of density into the network in order to minimize the probability of failure. Uh, and that's uh, more or less the end of the story. Uh, one thing that I want to uh, emphasize, of, was, of course, that there is much more in this kind of uh, uh, type of line of research. There is something on the paper, but I have no time to go into detail now. Thanks a lot for your attention.